Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Phoebe Kunduri, and I am um, going to be moderating uh, this uh, session on the European Union's plan towards the future we want. What is the future we want and how are we able to achieve this future? Let me share a couple of slides with you and then I will introduce the amazing panel of speakers that will allow us to discuss these issues from different angles, from the angle of the policy analysis, uh, from the angle of uh, investment and investment banks, from the angle of private finance, and of course, to see how innovation will enable facilitation of the implementation of the European Green Deal and acceleration of this implementation. The aim here is not just to talk about Europe, but to uh, discuss how this leadership example of Europe can create value and knowledge that can be transferred across the world. Thank you very much for being with us and let me share my slides so that I can start. So um, very, very quickly, what I wanted to uh, share with you before we start this uh, discussion is uh, to uh, very quickly uh, bring together the last uh, five to six years policy um, developments that are accelerating uh, this transition to sustainability. There's so much needed transition to sustainability. We have the 17 SDGs on all issues that have to do with uh, environmental sustainability, economic um, growth, and of course, social welfare. We have the climate agreement to try to uh, mitigate the effect of climate change as a well-documented um, uh, phenomenon that affects and threatens uh, the way uh, we live. Uh, and the agreement to uh, between 197 countries to try to limit global temperature well below two degrees. In two, uh, 2018, we have, of course, the intergovernmental policy plan on climate change saying that even two degrees uh, increase in average global temperature uh, at two degrees is too much. We need to limit this increase to 1.5 compared to pre-industrial levels. And on the same, uh, on the next year, 2019, the SDSN, the UN um, Sustainable Development Goals announces the uh, six pathways transformations, the six transformations that allow us to implement the 17 SDGs. We need to work on education, health, energy decarbonization, sustainable food, land, water, and ocean, sustainable cities and communities, and the digital revolution to sustainable development. And in 2019, late 2019, December, we have the European Green Deal. The European Green Deal is a commitment for climate neutrality by 2050, a commitment to protect human life, animals, and planets by cutting pollution, a commitment for helping um, a clean tech um, companies to, uh, uh, to achieve leadership, worldwide leadership, and of course, a commitment for this sustainability transition to happen in an inclusive way, to leave no one behind. And the deal has been uh, supported uh, by one trillion um, uh, budget, uh, some of it from EU budget, some uh, other uh, hope to be leveraged by public-private partnerships. And then early 2020, we have the coronavirus. We had the short-term responses to coronavirus, which basically aim at supporting the vulnerable, uh, the vulnerable groups in the society, the finance system as non-performing loans uh, started to mount, the SMEs from background seats, but we also had the 
a medium uh, term response, which was the next generation EU, an additional 750 billion um, to be uh, spent for its investments for a recovery in a sustainable and resilient way. And what is interesting is that this uh, recovery, the investments that will be funded by the Recovery and Resilient Fund should be climate mainstream and digital mainstream, and also respect the do no significant harm uh, principle for the environment. So our strategy remains uh, the European Green Deal, even this after this huge non-linearity of uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. And what is also very interesting is that by the end of 2020, the leaders of the EU member states have committed, have agreed to committing to increase the ambition with regards to the reduction of CO2 emissions uh, up to 55%. And 2021 is a year of hectic, very active uh, policy uh, announcements, legislative announcements, and so on. We have the announcement of the climate law, the first political agreement setting into law, the objective of climate neutrality by 2050 and 55% reductions in, in greenhouse gas emissions by 2030. We have the EU taxonomy, which is um, aiming at improving the flow of money towards sustainable activities, uh, that is climate change mitigation investments, climate change adaptation, sustainable use and protection of water and marine resources, circular economy, pollution prevention, biodiversity, also proposing a corporate sustainability reporting directive and also six amending delegated acts on fiduciary justice, investment and insurance advice to ensure that financial firms include sustainability in their procedures. And of course, lately, a few months ago, we have the Fit for 55, a package for, uh, with 19 legislative proposals in order to change uh, European policy in, in order to become consistent with the goal of uh, reducing uh, greenhouse gas emissions by 55% compared to what we have in 1990. Revision of the EU emissions trade system, climate action social facility, revision of the effort sharing population of the land use, land use change and forest regulation, a proposal for a carbon border adjustment mechanism, revision of renewable energy directive, revision of energy efficiency directive, um, revision of the energy taxation directive, new forest strategy, revision of the directive of deployment of alternative fuels, and uh, policies for mobility for vans, cars, aviation, and shipping. So a lot is going on, and it's not just going on in uh, Europe, it's the same in the UK, even a bigger ambition for 2030, 68% reduction in, in um, greenhouse gas emissions, and a policy, an industrial policy focus on the green and digital transition, and not just the UK, but also beyond Europe and the UK. If you looked at the Biden summit, we had a concentration of leaders representing 82% of world carbon emissions and 73% of world population aligning around the goal of deep decarbonization, including China committing to climate neutrality by 2060. This is what is going in the world, what is going on in the world, and this is um, how uh, uh, active this momentum for green deals and climate neutrality and investments for climate resilience uh, is um, is at the moment. And at the European um, uh, Hub of Sustainable Development Solutions Network, I lead with Jeff Sachs um, a report, an annual report on the transformations that are needed for the joint implementation of Agenda 2030 and the European Green Deal. 
And last year's report was a, an effort to bring together the SDGs, the European Green Deal, the European Semester Process Recommendation, and the EU Recovery Plan to support policymakers with actionable strategies that can guide EU-wide and national economic recovery in line with Europe's overreaching sustainability agenda. One of our main results was that there is a moral case for building forward better because the loans that we're gonna use in order to recover from COVID are gonna be paid for future generations. But the good news is that there is an economic case as well because our simulations confirm that the green economic stimulus is more growth enhancing than a return to normal stimulus. All these issues I'm incredibly honored uh, to uh, discuss today with a panel of four amazing speakers and one of their head of global challenges and SDG team at the Institute for European Environmental Policy, one of the most important institutes in the world um, focusing on analyzing European environmental policy. Laura Paiovesan, uh, Director of the Sustainability and Quality Management Department at the European Investment Bank. Mary Ryder, an International Ambassador of um, EIT, European Institute of Innovation and Technology, Climate Keep climate knowledge and information community, the person who turned the climate kick as the biggest public-private partnership accelerating the economy to climate neutrality. And of course, Mr. Kedan Padel, um, a CEO at uh, Greater Pacific uh, Capital. I'm thrilled that they accepted to talk with me. And I will start with my uh, first question addressing Antoine and asking uh, what are the main challenges ahead in implementing the European Green Deal? And what can the rest of the world learn from the challenges, but also the opportunities that this deal is, um, uh, is putting in front of us? Antoine? Thank you very much, Phoebe, and thank you very much for this uh, broad recapitulation of the <clears throat> legislative package that have been followed by the formal announcement of the Green Deal. I think it was necessary to give an idea of the, of the amplitude of that, of that particular plan, of that particular package, which is uh, part of the global fight at the moment. Um, as we know, the European Green Deal is intended to have uh, an impact well beyond EU's uh, border for the simple fact that EU has been has always been a very large emitter of greenhouse gas and is so far as responsibility toward the fight against uh, climate change. And the EU at the moment is wants, uh, clearly wants to be a leader in that, uh, in that particular fight. We see it every day. And this is the narrative behind the uh, launch of the European Green Deal and of the many, many legislative proposals that you've just, um, that you've just outlined. The, Absolute objective, of course, is to uh, support the achievement of the agreement of, in Paris in 2015 to maintain world global temperature around 1.5 degrees to avoid the most the detrimental effects of climate change toward the world. That is the main objective of that uh, European Green Deal that was announced in 2019. And this, I think, uh, in terms of the impact and in terms of the challenges that it poses, I would also like to have a, a good word beyond the, the challenges that I really like in the presentation, the chronology that you presented from 2015 to today. And I think it shows an acceleration of initiatives. There is more and more being published. There is more and more being done at the moment. We can see that from 2019, 2020, 2021, despite the COVID-19 pandemic, there's been a huge amount of legislative packages that have been proposed by the EU. You've named uh, many of them, and this is still an ongoing effort since the EU is expected to propose new initiatives before the end of this year. So for instance, on the due diligence for corporations on deforestation, for instance, or on sustainable products, make sure that product footprints can be uh, maintained below acceptable levels. So this is um, part, 
parts of this global effort that the EU intends to have a leading role on. And of course, a major milestone will be a month, couple of months from now at the COP26 in Glasgow. This is, will be an important moment to take stock of where we are at the moment in this fight. If that acceleration over the past few years is actually embedded into concrete proposal, because this is what remains the most important, concrete actions, concrete proposals. Um, we've, there is a lot of work being done, as I said, on the legislative issue, and I'm sure we'll be going toward today with Ketan and other, other panelists on the financing issue, which is, of course, a major aspect of this, of this fight. I wanted to do a few words on the uh, challenges for the European Green Deal very briefly. Before that, I would like to share my screen to show you, uh, to broadcast a study that we've been doing at the IEP recently. So if you don't mind, I will try and share my screen. Yes, of course, please do. Do you see my presentation? Very well. So this is where the European Green Deal barometer that with the studies that we've done at the IEEP in collaboration with Globescan. It is an idea to follow, to monitor the implementation of the Green Deal and how it is perceived. This is how we show some, we, we hope to show some impact and the challenges in its implementation. So since we are not a bit limited on time, I will not go through the methodology, but if you later on, there will be some questions on that, I'd be happy to answer them on the methodology that uh, we've done for this study. A quick word is that I would simply like to say that this is not a methodology, this is not a survey among the public, this is a survey among the stakeholders. So people that are already potentially interested in the European Green Deal issues, and for half of them at least, that are specialists on environmental issues. So not the general public, but already stakeholders. And despite this, we see that only 48% half of people are familiar with the European Green Deal, which can be considered very low. It could be considered very low if we were talking about the public, and now we are talking about stakeholders. And yet there is a lack of awareness of what is the European Green Deal, what it is doing, what are the impacts, what are the expectations. So this is obviously a challenge in itself to raise awareness among the European Green Deal, among EU citizens at least. Now, we'd like to focus a bit more on the technical areas. I will not dwell on that too long, but simply to show an example. To, to mention that, as, we, as you said, there's been a lot of uh, efforts at the legislative level recently with the increasing EU climate ambition. As you can see, this diagram shows in perspective the level of priority, increased priority or lower priority, and the progress made by the EU uh, in, in terms of legislation recently. You see that areas where we can have a comparative advantage are the most important ones, and this is increasing EU's climate ambition. This is the Fit for 55 package that you've demonstrated. This, is, this demonstrates that the EU has a leading role in terms of action at the moment. With various ambitions, but still good ones, when you talk about uh, secure energy, when you talk about efficient building renovation, smart mobility, and so on, these are all part of the package that has been announced a couple of months ago. And you can see, of course, that there are still some efforts to do with a food system, with ecosystems, biodiversity, and so on. These are the aspects where the EU has not yet done enough for the stakeholders that we have uh, surveyed. And a very important point that I would like to make is on circular economy. The EU Circular Economy Action Plan has been announced two years ago. It is a massive priority, and that at the moment we're at the border between enough and not enough. So maybe a bit more effort will be needed on circular economy aspect as part of the implementation of the EU Green Deal. That could be an opportunity, as I will be going very, very soon later. What I wanted to say about the main challenges. And this is also go with the lack of awareness. There is a lack of commitment by member states to the European Green Deal agenda. At some point, there is so much that the EU can do. Member states of the EU have to take over and have to implement these policies into the national systems. And this, at the moment, is lacking. The EU is a leading actor. At the moment, there is an issue with the, how member states actually transpose this legislation and these efforts at their own national level. And this is partially due to an inadequate governance mechanism. And this is a bit more profound. 
with the EU, Green Deal lacks a narrative, lacks an overall approach, lacks a monitoring governance system. And so insofar as that makes it easy to meet your objectives when you have just individual initiatives here and there, rather than a holistic approach and a dedicated governance system. This is a major challenge for the EU. And third challenge, again, linked the multi-speed Europe with unequal progress among member states. This is linked to the two challenges that I've just mentioned. This is a message that I wanted to pass mostly today. The EU has a leading role, has done a lot of efforts in terms of legislative packages. Now it needs to be transposed through a, a government mechanism at the national level into effective policies. In terms of opportunity, what the uh, Green Deal could provide, as I've mentioned, low carbon, circular and resilient supply chains in clean energy sector. This is the key part. This is really related to the circular economy action plan that we've mentioned and to the major initiatives that are being done. But this is a technical aspect where some effort should be made and what the EU Green Deal could provide. The second and the third, second, we will be talking more about it, finance. How do we finance, especially with private finance, the Green Deal and the transition and the just transition? And as a third opportunity, the EU being a global leader, this I think we're seeing it and we need to see it more. Some, as you've mentioned, China, you've mentioned in the US, there are other actors, of course, that need to uh, upgrade their efforts, and the EU needs to be a leader in that particular. Some key recommendations, I will go through them to, uh, because I think I'm running out of time. To the recovery funds, you've mentioned finance again. How do we use the recovery funds of the COVID-19 pandemic? There is a lot of financial efforts being done. It needs to be geared toward Green Deal objectives more than it is at the moment. The cap reform, food system within the EU and globally. Circular economy, again, it's there all the time. and the in investments aspect. The SDGs, you've mentioned them in your priority, they need to be embedded into EU policies more than they are at the moment. They're always talked about, but they are not embedded in the policies with, target, with targets, timelines, effective ones. This needs, there needs to be an effort on that particularly. Standards, EU is a ma major standard setter in the world, and this could also be a way of action local and regional authorities. The EU, at, its, at the EU level, cannot and should not do everything. We need to empower member states, we need to empower local and regional authorities to implement the EU Green Deal, to operationalize it. And again, raising awareness. I started with that, I'm going to close with that. Raising awareness among stakeholders, among member states, among citizens, as what the EU Green Deal is and what it intends to do. Thank you. Thank you very much, Antoine. Extremely interesting, and uh, I am I, I am really surprised. I mean, uh, food and biodiversity. You have um, farm to fork policy in the European Green Deal. You have sustainable agriculture. You have protection of biodiversity, uh, and. And then with regards to circular economy, this huge initiative on circular economy, and still the people think that there is not enough engagement there. This is quite surprising, which basically tells you that whatever is uh, the policies at the European level do not really get transposed at the national level, even if they are like, they, they are transposed into national laws, they are not really implemented at the national level. Not enough mobilization is there. We have a question for you. Uh, what does lack of commitment by member states mean exactly? So as you know, the EU member states have, have by to transpose EU legislation into their own national laws. However, that the, depending on what EU legislation is implementing, whether it's a directive, whether it's a reglement, they do have some flexibility into how they transpose this particular legislation. And we see that sometimes the way they transpose it is not as ambitious as the 
original, uh, the orig objective one. So this is part of it. And the second one is timeline. Sometimes member states can take a very long time to actually implement it effectively on the, mm -hmm. at the national level, this, beyond political announcements. This is mm -hmm. another aspect of this lack of uh, commitment that we, that we can see. Yeah, but could it be that it's not lack of commitment and it's lack of capacity? I mean, in my country and in many of the countries that I, I work through uh, research projects and through my role as SDSN uh, uh, European Chair, we have more than 400 uh, institutions as members. There is serious lack of capacity. The, the, the institutions, uh, the, the policymakers, the politicians, the financial sector, the businesses, the NGOs, even the universities, they don't know what circular economy is. They don't know what nature-based solutions are. They are not clear on what a systems approach means when you are dealing with a transformation. Does, uh, do, we, do we provide this capacity and support for implementation? Is it lack of commitment or lack of capacity or both? It is obviously both. It is not obviously simply a lack of commitment for pure political reasons. There is a lack of capacity in many EU member states to effectively transpose the objectives of the Green Deal. Absolutely. That's, that's, that's needless to say. And this is, of course, a joint problem. And again, the EU, there is so much as the EU can do in terms of capacity to, the member states in, in many ways have more capacity than the EU in, so to implement effective policies in their own national systems. So all of this is obviously, is obviously embedded and the EU needs to support the member states in to effectively implement the European Green Deal. But at some moment, all actors need to play their part. It's also linked to the empowering of local and regional authorities that can have a lot of uh, importance in some member states with a lot of decentralization. So, um, legislative um, systems, for instance, in Spain or in Belgium, that have more, much more powers at the local or regional authorities. There in lies more um, efforts need to be made. So, of course, the question of capacity is a question of commitment. Is a question of all actors playing their part. Of course, thank you so much. Uh, you also mentioned finance, and I'm going to ask Laura to uh, tell us, as director of the Sustainability and Quality Management Department of the European Investment Bank. What is the role of uh, Europe's climate bank? We all look at the European Investment Bank for a leadership example on how uh, a, a mission of a bank can change, of an investment bank can change in order to reconceptualize, to be reconceptualized and include uh, financial sustainability and, of course, embrace the EU taxonomy. Laura? Uh, thank you. Thank you, Phoebe, and good morning uh, to you, the panelists, uh, and, and all the attendees, and thank you for inviting me to this debate. I, I listened with very much attention both to your introduction and, and to one uh, very good analysis of you know, the challenges and the opportunities of the Green Deal. And uh, I do agree with, with both of you when you say that you know, it's extremely ambitious and comprehensive uh, plan which addresses climate, environment. You mentioned you know, all the different uh, uh, areas addressed by it, uh, and also social development, uh, all aimed at uh, reaching carbon neutrality by 2050. Essentially, it is a new growth strategy for Europe, uh, and as I mentioned, comprehensive in a number of areas. Clearly, uh, as mentioned by Antoine, no, investments are an opportunity, an opportunity which also raises the challenge of how do we finance these investments, which both private and public finance, and how do we catalyze this financing? And I think uh, an important uh, element of this plan is uh, uh, also an ambitious approach to financing through establishing a common language uh, for sustainable finance. Without a common language, the financial mar markets struggle to identify uh, sustainable investments. There is you know, this lack of awareness. It's also there in the financing uh, world. You know? What is green and how 
can we you know identify track and report on the green um, lending and the impact of our uh, financing and so to, to uh, central for this is indeed the EU sustainable finance taxonomy at the European Investment Bank, as the EU Bank, we are putting our financing at work in support of the Green Deal and in line with the um, with common language of, of the taxonomy. So last year, in fact, uh, we operationalized our commitment to the Green Deal by launching our ambitious EIB Group Climate Bank Roadmap. It's a five-year plan, which is structured around the core teams of the Green uh, Deal indeed. And taxonomy is our compass in this journey, in this ambition. What have we committed to? As a EU bank, we have committed to align all our financing activities to the goal of the Paris Agreement, dedicate at least 50% of our financing to climate action and environmental sustainability by 2025, and through this, support 1 trillion of climate and environmental investments in the decade to 2030. Um, Antoine mentioned um, that also one of the main challenges of the Green Deal in Europe is uh, the support to a just transition. And this is embedded indeed in the Green Deal. We focus on the most vulnerable groups of society which are adversely affected by this structural shift from carbon intensive activities. We said Green Deal can be opportunities for growth, but it needs to be an opportunity of growth for all of Europe and in fact outside and for all the society within Europe. So it needs to be social inclusive and creates opportunities and offers support to ensure that no one is less left behind. And this is applicable within Europe, but we also need to extend our reach outside Europe. And, and there, that's an, also an area where EAB can play a role because um, already, uh, also outside Europe, we had an important focus on, on climate action. In the last five years, more than a third of our lending outside Europe in developing countries was for climate action. And we intend to increase further this support also outside Europe. Climate change is causing an unprecedented unprecedented loss of biodiversity and is threatening our ecosystems and our life. No one will escape these effects and we need to mobilize globally and promote new green technologies. Partnerships are keys when we want to tackle such a big challenge. So we are doing this, of course, as part of Team Europe, so a broader uh, coalition with, with, um, with, within Europe to step up and from the, what concerns the AB, we have stepped up in lending. We are also stepping up our advisory services, in particular for innovative solution in climate adaptation and mitigation, as well as biodiversity and natural capital. When we, our focus in particular outside Europe in less developed countries and small island states is going to be around the climate adaptation because it's important indeed to underline that climate change will also disproportionately affect the more vulnerable regions and communities. And coping with this impact requires the urgent action. On climate adaptation, we are also being active in this sphere for over a decade, and our support has contributed to better prepare and protect citizens, citizens, business and ecosystems from the negative effect of climate change. In the Climate Bank Roadmap, we focus indeed not only on the mitigation, but also on the adaptation. And we um, committed to prepare an adaptation plan. So we will soon come, and you mentioned the COP26, where we are a bit ch checking where we stand in this progress. And also the bank will want to come and, and, and talk about what we are doing about the adaptation, for example. An area where indeed we want to focus within Europe, and outside Europe on those regions and sectors that are most vulnerable to the impact of climate change and where the needs for finance are greater. As I already mentioned, the partnership are key and we continue with work with external uh, partners to support adaptation solutions 
uh, to protect the people and the business and the ecosystems. For example, digital technologies for agriculture, food security, resilient cities and infrastructures, and jobs and entrepreneurship for the youth. So to conclude, uh, Phoebe, uh, finance, both public and private, is indeed key to unlock the substantial investments which are uh, needed to enable the ambitious transformation which the Green Deal is aiming at. And the taxonomy, by giving us a common language, can help catalyze this green investment and avoiding greenwashing. But in this journey, we must not forget you know, this, this um, uh, focus on a sustainable and just transition. And I think this indeed um, is what makes the Green Deal so aligned and compatible with the targets of Agenda 2030. Thank you. Thank you so much, Laura. Uh, very, very clear and very integrated way to um, showcase uh, how we want to make this transition. And you over, already answered the question that we had on, on the contribution and importance and central uh, stage of forest and environmental education. We, we have uh, policies on, uh, on land use and forest and all that. Environmental education will come a bit later, uh, Christopher, and we will uh, come back to your question. But I also have another very interesting question, Laura, which says, and I want to ask you this, I, I, I have the same question. What steps are being taken to assure the intersectional approaches uh, to create climate solutions that leave no one behind? That is, if I, if I can rephrase the question that Lucy has posed, does the bank uh, understand or uh, requirements Inter it requires intersectoral systemic approaches uh, that uh, in order to finance a particular investment. So you have a particular investment. Do you look at the impact on the different systems, the energy system, the land use and, and forest system, the mobility system? Or is it that you focus on uh, investments um, independently? Uh, the, how, how do you uh, bring into the picture this intersectoral holistic need approach need that we have identified? No, thank you. Thank you, Fabi. Very interesting uh, questions. Um, well, I think. I think I briefly mentioned that we are not only about financing, but also advisory. You know? So indeed, uh, uh, the investments need to be placed in a broader strategy, be at country level, global level. So, you know, not only we look at investments uh, that we want to support uh, and we do an assessment of investments and we look at the uh, outcomes and impact of this investment and we monitor that, but also we want to engage upstream. We want, by providing advisory services, both in terms of capacity building, and one mentioned a different uh, um, uh, you know, speed you know, in the different uh, countries or regions. And we want to intervene upstream in building capacity, in really discussing with the regions and, and the countries their, their national plans for mitigation and adaptation and see how can we best support what is the priorities? Uh, um, because indeed we want our investment to be impactful, no? Exactly. So to focus, I think there is a big broader need and, and, and uh, um, the following speaker will also talk about the role of course of private finance. So again, we need to be complementary, we need to be focused and we need to prioritize. Thank you so much, Laura. And Thank indeed, uh, uh, Kedan Badel, CEO of Greater Pacific Capital, will talk about the, the, the role of uh, private finance. Because as Laura said, uh, we need public-private uh, partnerships and the ability to leverage private money 
it's something uh, to be proven rather than something to be taken from granted. Uh, Kedan Badel is, uh, has just released uh, an amazing report on uh, capital as a force for good, capitalism for sustainable future, with some amazing results with regards to our um, uh, uh, with regards to financing need in order to implement the SDGs and of course the European Green Deal, which is consistent with the SDGs. Kedan, the floor is yours. Thank you, Phoebe. Um, uh, delighted to be here and um, excellent to listen to uh, Antoine and Laura uh, particularly describe the challenge and um, Laura, you know, how uh, the development institutions um, like the IB, which are very important in addressing these challenges. We, we looked at 100 financial institutions to see their efforts at a very granular level and their commitments and their deployment of capital too. We also looked at the, the system of capital in the world and how money flows through the system. Um, and then ground up, we, we tried to examine the SDG targets and what it would really take to achieve uh, what, what, what has just been said is um, the kind of moral commitment to achieving these very important goals, to establish the base for the world from which we can transition to perhaps a different energy source um, that might be more radical and functional and uh, abundant in the future. What we found was, was quite shocking. The first was that um, the SDGs currently do get a financing of three to four trillion every year, um, but the gap is something closer to 84 to 101 trillion dollars if you take into account a few very specific things. First is uh, the climate related costs that are now much clearer than they were when the SDGs were first formulated and in the revisions that are recent uh, to the estimates. Two, the cost of creating a broader inclusion and that's financial inclusion, educational, digital, healthcare and so on. Third, if you update for current prices. And fourth, if you take properly into account the effects of the pandemic, which have placed a lot of people into systemic and structural poverty again. So I'm, I'm sure you could go even further and you might find the number is bigger. But if we, if we just focus for the moment that $100 trillion is the gap, and if you take into account what has been financed already, then we're at 110 to $140 trillion of total budget required just to 2030. And of course, the world's challenges don't finish at 2030. And most of the climate change commitments go beyond 2030. So, you know, we, we have an ongoing challenge to use the financial system and change behaviors such that we can finance these, these big, big numbers. Um, the first thing, if we step back, is it's not possible to free up $100 trillion from the financial system as a donation. You know, it has to be something that is a real profitable commitment to make. And I think what climate as a movement, as a global movement has demonstrated is that you can find investable projects and investable companies, and you can inspire trillions of dollars of commitments as a result. Um, the 100 financial institutions we looked at are the leading financial institutions in the world, um, and they represent about $170 trillion of assets, of financial assets. And their commitments are 88 trillion to addressing these challenges. And that's unprecedented. You know, this is um, actually 10 times the previous commitment of the previous year. So you can see there's been a marked step up. So what climate has done in terms of releasing this is what we need for the other SDGs. The same treatment in terms of simplifying the problem, communicating it well, and, may, and finding the investable opportunities. Um, clearly also money needs to meet the issues with these opportunities. And private sector and individuals are probably the most powerful players and corporates are next. What we found was if you take the money in the world, governments don't have enough financial liquid capital to deploy. Um, their commitments are generally fixed in any year to many, many things. And in an emergency, as we saw during the pandemic, they, they're able to print huge amounts of money with potentially, as Phoebe, you and I have discussed before, with inflationary implications, of course, built in and other risks. But you know, it, it is a limited pool of money that in any year a government can free up. And there is something like $400 trillion of gross financial liquid assets in any one year. 
As it turns out, two thirds of that begins with the individual. And I think the most powerful player stakeholder in, in the change going forward, therefore, will be the individual. Increasingly, the individual is aware of what the consequences are of their buying decisions, whether they're buying a financial product or something at the supermarket and all their actions and decisions. And I think over a not too long period of time, what we saw happen in politics, where the individual upended politics, this will happen in business and finance too. They will choose who they think is an ethical player, who is a committed player to something positive in the world. And so I think we're, we're headed for a very big change in that regard. But the money does end up in the financial system and 85% of it is ultimately managed, controlled, governed in some form by financial institutions. So an outsized role does belong to the financial institutions. Um, corporates, of course, have the solutions that can get financed. And so, you know, that's a very important part of the solution too. They control the supply chains, they make investment decisions that can be green or not green and so on. Uh, having said this about governments though, in terms of the, the financial capacity, um, of course, when, when governments don't have the financial capacity, they will introduce legislation and regulation. And so the, the change is likely to be a systemic change. And in that regard, it seems as if Europe is leading. The European Green Deal is, is wider. And even with the challenges uh, that Antoine very clearly pointed out, it, it is attempting to be a platform for big systemic change. And so I think this is very powerful. Uh, having spoken to people in China who are policymakers, um, they intend to copy a lot of what the EU is producing. America's approach is, is very different. And America has taken a much more private sector, big bets approach, where the large financial institutions are making very large bets on things like climate change and things like mass inclusion of their own populations um, that are underserved or underbanked and so on. And so um, these are two different approaches, but it, it, it's interesting to see whether big bets can be the systemic change. And I would doubt it. And so I think over time, there'll be a convergence around a series of regulations, particularly because um, the world is interconnected. But for now, we have a, a, I'll call it a heroic effect on, on the private sector side in America, where the 10 largest institutions are committing trillions of dollars to things like climate change, and tens and hundreds of billion dollars to other major uh, issues embedded in the SDGs. Um, while in, in Europe, we have smaller tickets uh, of investments being written, but we have, a, we have the governments uh, of the EU combined together to, to form a platform of big change. Um, I have a lot more to say, Phoebe, but your time will run out. So I should pause there. There is a question. I, I love this analysis because it puts into perspective in a very holistic way where the money in the world is and who can mobilize it and how. Uh, because Kedan is saying that uh, Europe is, is having regulation and legislation and is trying to mobilize uh, to uh, direct the flow of investment through these uh, tools, whereas uh, the US approach is more a, a private initiative and bets. And, and there is a question, Kedan, uh, which uh, says, uh, we all think that the COP will not manage, or at least will fall uh, in, in terms of uh, the uh, ambition that uh, we have, uh, we are expecting with regards to uh, achieving uh, uh, a, a commitment that is consistent with climate neutrality by 2050. So we have the COP this year, we have the Food Summit this year, we have the Biodiversity Summit this year, we have G20 this year. All these are public, let's say, approaches. How yeah. can the private finance, which I understand, it cannot do everything alone, you need regulation and you need legislation and you need uh, tax policies that incentivize towards uh, uh, the sustainability transition. But how can the finance world uh, um, uh, create partnerships 
the private finance, create partnerships with these high level events that are basically events that engage public institutions, but also are, are private. How can the two um, create an osmosis that will be really uh, powerful in accelerating the transition? It's a very difficult question, but how yes. can you see it? Because you have very inspirational ideas. Sure, so look, I would say, Laura has part of the answer, right? Because the financial institutions that are the development institutions were the original force for good. They were set up to address the biggest issues in the world. The challenge, unfortunately, is that, you know, for example, last year, as I understand it, approximately $250 billion was deployed by development institutions. Um, but if we have to close a gap of $100 trillion, it can't be closed without a different stakeholder agreement between us all about how we will deploy this capital, under what rules, what returns, and so on. And let's say the world fell into a number of buckets. One was uh, where we need a return so we can service the tax requirements of governments, the pensions of all of us on this call, the educational requirements for all of us, and so on and so on. Well, that, that's quite a high bar return that we need to deliver. The second category may be ones where we're willing to take a much lower return just for the impact. And the third, unfortunately, would be a series of countries or projects that will not get funded because they don't have the, they don't meet the ESG requirements. And the, the private sector financial institutions will not know how to address them. But the development agencies um, and institutions have long addressed countries and projects that appear unfundable. And they have the expertise, they have the experience, and they know how to approach them. One of the, one of the, 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 um, the important things is, on the one hand, we have the institutions like the UN and you know, many others that have the knowledge of all the problems of the world. On the other side, you have the financial institutions that have, to, to coin a phrase, all the money in the world. But in between has to be the opportunities. And the opportunities have to be profitable for them to deploy. Otherwise, they do not meet their mandate as far as they can tell. Now, we could change those mandates, but if we change them incorrectly, we probably undermine the system of wealth creation that pays everybody's mortgages and salaries and pensions and insurance and so on. So if Europe is successful, it will create a superior system of enterprise. America today has a superior system of enterprise because of its form of capitalism that is aggressive at making money. So we, we, need, we need to figure out how the balance is struck so that the system of wealth creation is still intact and the regulations don't undermine that. Otherwise we'll have other crises, many other crises where things won't be paid that are paid today. And yes. uh, we have lots of ideas to do that. Um, but I think we've, in the report, we identify a dozen investment themes that we think can be very commercial, but it does need the people with all the knowledge and the people with all the money and the people with the solutions to come together, be brought together to have a very concrete discussion on every SDG almost, to drill it down to say what is fundable. Indeed, thank you, Kedan. We, we need to support the win-win storyline, yeah. support yeah. it with finance, with policies, with capacity, with scientific solutions, and with engagement with all the stakeholders. And of course, we can do nothing without technology. Technology is a major driver. Without technology, we cannot achieve climate neutrality. We cannot achieve uh, climate resilience. And I'm extremely thankful uh, for Mary uh, Ryder, who is uh, uh, an inspirational woman. She uh, created the EIT Climate Kick, the, and uh, nowadays, uh, Europe's largest public-private partnership addressing climate change and ask uh, how the uh, climate kick is uh, trying through systems innovation and the deep demonstration um, as, that it runs uh, to um, accelerate the engagement uh, for climate neutrality, and uh, uh, which is 
um, the backbone of which is accelerating uh, innovation and research commercialization and engaging in this acceleration, the stakeholders. Mary, thank you so much. The floor is yours. Thank you for being here. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Phoebe. And it's a, a pleasure to join you today. Yes, Climate Kick, um, we established Climate Kick in 2010. Um, and our work focuses very much on the EIT's signature innovation model of integrating um, innovation and entrepreneurship and, and education. Um, just thinking of earlier comments, um, we are there for the whole of Europe um, and we have a regional innovation scheme to ensure this. So for countries that may have a smaller number of KIC partners, because overall Climate KIC has 400 partners across the whole of Europe, um, but for those that have perhaps a smaller number of partners or um, may have a modest innovation score, according to the European um, Innovation Scoreboard, we have this regional innovation scheme um, with 14 hubs across uh, Southern and, and Eastern Europe. And um, we're delighted that the SDSN and Phoebe yourself are closely involved with our hub in Greece. They play a key role as, as local catalysts. So we have hubs across the north, the south, the east and the west of Europe, um, the main hubs and then these regional innovation ones. Our absolute key approach is systems innovation. Um, and we believe that's absolutely what you need for radical transformations. So we look at whole countries, whole cities, whole regions, industries, value chains. Um, and to give you an example, work on cities will focus on energy, water, transport, buildings, waste, and also look at the enablers of technology, finance, of policy, um, knowledge and behavior. So how do we do that? Well, we have four main stages for our systems innovation. First of all, we sit down with the challenge owners and we map out the challenge. So we sit down with city mayors or regional leaders or company CEOs. And we try to understand their needs and their ambition for transitional change. And then next with them, we define the strategy um, and we identify where and how innovation can catalyze change. And then we design a portfolio around the key leverage points um, and build on our 10 years of experience and something like 1,500 partners um, and projects and startups. Um, we then orchestrate a whole portfolio of projects, maybe up to 100, to address those leverage points. Um, so we might focus on education or the technology or citizen engagement, policy or finance. And then finally, we have sense making approaches so that we can analyze pro um, progress and then use feedback loops to, to map um, continuing ongoing um, progress. So that's the methodology. We apply it in practice through large scale projects that we call deep demonstrations. And through those, as Climate Kick, we can often offer uh, systems innovation as a service, as a model um, for Europe's most ambitious challenge owners. So for example, we have eight demonst deep demonstrations at the moment. One is in healthy, clean cities, looking at 15 cities right across the North, South, East and West of Europe. We have another in transitions in heavy industrial regions, fo focusing very much, for example, on the coal regions of Germany and Poland. Um, and we have others such as circular regenerative economies and landscapes as carbon sinks. So these deep demonstrations really act as test beds to show what can be done and what can then be replicated elsewhere right across the globe. So they're intended as inspirational examples of, of what is possible, so what others can do. And I know we're getting quite short on time, so just briefly, we are working across the globe. We've done it either alone. Um, I was involved in establishing Climate Kick in Australia, which gives us a collaborative, independent innovation platform in the Asia Pacific, with some really interesting projects in many areas, including energy finance. And we also have done it in partnerships with other kicks um, in the EIT family um, in Israel, um, China, until it was paused for political reasons recently, 
um, California, and then very much we want to um, establish um, hubs and work in, in Africa. Um, and I guess just on a final comment about linking and the very interesting comments about the difference between Europe and, and North America, um, we're linking very much with the government of California. So trying to link the European Green Deal with the Green New Deal um, of California and particularly focusing on, on zero emissions transport to start with. So it's a pan-European approach, um, but very much linking with other innovation, innovation ecosystems across the world. Indeed, it's a pan-European approach. I've used the approach of as Climate Cape Cup director here in Greece. It is uh, amazing to see how much response you have uh, from the stakeholders once you decide to really invest in engaging them, co-create the future vision with them and co-design the pathways that will get them to the future vision. But it needs time and money and effort and knowledge and capacity. And this is what we want to try to build. Thank you so much for being here. Kedan says we could be speaking for hours. We could be speaking for days. Uh, it is um, uh, always a huge pleasure to see the different sectors coming together and agreeing on what needs to be done. It is. Uh, we are at a point in time that science has spoken, we need to mitigate climate change and conserve biodiversity. Technology developers have created the technology in, in most sectors that we need for this climate neutrality and climate adaptation and biodiversity protection. It is now up to the policymakers and the financial institutions and the institutions that work on engaging the stakeholders to really develop detailed pathways, financial policy and technological pathways that we allow each and every country with the different uh, idiosyncratic features of the developed and uh, world and the global south pathways that will allow this transition will accelerate and facilitate the implementation of the sustainability transition. Thank you all so much for being here. Feel free to send us email questions or any other interaction you would like to have with us. Thank you for being here and thanks to the amazing panelists. It has been an honor. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Phoebe. Thank you, thank you all. Thank you.